Where did it come from? The people who originally did it, they had a reason for why they did it. Have you heard the story about um, a, a woman who, as growing up as a girl, she watched her mother bake a roast and her mother, for Easter, it was a very special thing, and for Easter she would cut off the end, put the roast in the pan, put the end on the side, and bake it. And when the woman grew up, she did the same thing, special for Easter. The roast, cut off the end, put it in the big pan. <clears throat> she finally asked her mom, Mom, why do we do that? And her mother said, the pan was too small. <laughs> but she just kept on doing it, even though she had a big pan, because she didn't know. What was the function of that? Why do we do that? So the same thing with a headscarf. It had a function. And one of the functions I just mentioned in the prayer time was the covering calms you. It eliminates distractions. Have you seen the pictures of the monks who wear the cowl? It goes over their head. Yeah, the monasteries were cold, it was probably for that, but it's also that sense of quiet and calming, so you can go inside. As Mabu just sang, open our hearts that we may hear thy voice, which constantly comes from within. The shawl is a tool of the trade. If you want to pray, if you want to really connect with yourself, use the tool of the headscarf so you can have that experience. Anybody who brought a scarf with them and tried it, any, any thoughts? How was that for you? What, what was your experience? I felt like I could concentrate You could concentrate better. Interesting. Yeah, anybody else? Bazid? I, I noticed my mind was very still. Was still? Uh-huh. Peaceful, very still and quiet. Still, quiet, peaceful. Thank you. Anyone else who tried it? Calming, calming. So that's the function of it, one of the functions. So another function of the headscarf is it sets you aside. If you wear one, you're different. You're set aside from people who don't. Again, I was raised Catholic. And I was in the sixth grade, in the second grade, I was six years old. Until that time, it was required in the Catholic Church, yep, you remember, to, for girls and women to cover your head before you went into a church. So I grew up with it. And I remember I was out on a family trip. We were at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, and we were gonna go in to the cathedral, and my mom pulls out her, you know, she had hers with her, and my aunts, everybody, I didn't have mine. Uh, and so, what are we gonna do? Uh, panic, panic. The solution, you know the solution, a Kleenex. You put a Kleenex on the head. And so my brothers are like tormenting, eh, you look stupid, and they were right. I had a Kleenex, I looked really dumb. And for me, it set me aside and it made me feel like there was something wrong with me, different in a bad way, like diminished by it. It was, it was a yucky feeling. I have another, a friend, Maureen, author, also grew up Catholic, she's just a little older than me, and she remembers wearing the head covering. And for her, it set her aside in a way that made her feel special, lifted. What can be more sacred, more beautiful than a woman or a girl who will become a woman, who will someday perhaps bear children? The sacredness of the female body and Maureen as a young girl feeling, wow, this says I'm special, I'm elevated. So the headscarf sets you aside. Does it set you aside in a way that you feel ugh and diminished like I did or in a way that you feel elevated? 
and respect it like Maureen. Same object, same tradition, different experiences and different interpretations. And I certainly know Muslim women, most of the Muslim women I know, feel like Maureen. They feel the scarf elevates them. It sets them aside as you are sacred. You are beautiful. You matter. And I know some Muslim women who feel diminished by it. And my heart goes out to them because I know what it feels like. So that's another function of the headscarf, the setting, setting aside. Another function of the headscarf is privacy. That it closes off from view. As modern, <laughs> as modern Americans, we almost don't know what privacy means. <laughs> Reality TV, and people go on those shows and they say, what? Oi, it's just embarrassing. To s There's no sense of, this is private. This is not public. We've lost that public-private distinction. And just notice again, how do you feel? That's private. You can't know what's behind there. How do you feel about that? So what, or does it really bug you? There are things that need to be private. And when they are shared, they are diminished. They become less by the sharing of them. And we've just about lost that sense in modern Western culture. And so someone who is giving a visual of this is private, it's a bit countercultural right now. And there are other functions that the headscarf can play. So the question that comes to me is about choice. Who's choosing to dress in what way? Who's choosing to wear a headscarf? Are they choosing or not? Again, back to my own experience as a Catholic growing up, I wore a uniform every day from first grade till my escape in high school. Pleated wool skirt, knee socks, all of that, to say I hated it is too small. Detest, I don't know if that even gets it. I couldn't stand it. And I, to send a kid out, and I lived in New England. I mean, it's cold there. With, you know, your knees exposed, it was, ter it was like, what are these adults thinking? I wanted to wear pants. I could, I was not allowed to wear pants even when it was cold. Drove me nuts. <sighs> but then, I went to high school, and we had new uniforms that year. And I went to go get fitted for my uniform, and guess what? There was an option of pants. It was the 70s. It was a wild time. <laughs> and I ordered the pants, and the wool skirt as well. And I showed up First day, wearing my pants, and there was only one other girl in the whole class of 200 who was wearing pants, Sally, and she was the least popular girl in the school. <laughs> and my friends look at me like, Melon, what are you doing? And I'm like, they're pants. We can sit on the floor. I can run around. You know, I'm not cold. It's great. And they're like, Melon, they are ugly. They are polyester. They are maroon. They've got that elastic waist, they've got that little pleaty thing that, oh, they, they're ugly. And I said, I know they're ugly, but they're pants. And they're like, Melon, you gotta lose those things. 
You look like a dork. And they were right, I did, but I was comfortable. So what did I do? Did I wear those pants again or not? No. And my mom was really mad because she spent money on those pants and they, and maybe I, if I had real guts, I might have worn them once or twice again, but. So I was under a regime in the new high school where I could wear pants, I was allowed, but there was peer pressure. Do you ever feel that way about stuff? <laughs> and so for women wearing the headscarf, I know women who want to wear a headscarf. A friend of mine is Imam, and uh, the spiritual leader of the mosque in New Hampshire. His daughter wants to wear a headscarf. He doesn't want her to. You know why? He's afraid for her. He's afraid if she wears it, she will be a target of harassment and perhaps even violence. So she's getting pressure from dad, the imam, don't wear it, honey. And I, I know other women, Muslim women, who don't want to wear the headscarf. But they know if they don't, they will be pressurized, as I was by my high school friends, to wear it anyway. So choice. Whose choice is it? I can say with confidence that most of the Muslim women I know are wearing their headscarf because they want to. It's their choice. And we certainly live in a country where it's a choice. Externally, but is it internally? When I first was thinking about this sermon, I wanted to call it Our Bodies as Battlegrounds. Because really my question is, whose business is it? Why does it matter so much what women wear? Why that intrusiveness and control and focus? And something I really love about the headscarf and the wearing of the headscarf and the women I talk to who wear it say, they are saying, I'm not eye candy. My body is not your business. If you want to judge me, judge me on my character. Judge me on my actions. Judge me on my intelligence. Judge me on my words, my loving presence in the world. Don't judge me on my body. So there's a strength. And there are Muslim feminists who see the hijab as a form of empowerment. Wild, huh? <laughs> who would have thought that? And I want to invite us. You know, we look outside ourselves and point a finger. Why are they wearing that? What should, they shouldn't do that. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I want to invite ourselves first to look at our own costumes and customs of attire. And I, I'm going to show you what's behind here. There are things that we wear and do all the time that are actually pretty detrimental to our health. And backpacks are one of them. Ask your chiropractor. You see kids, you know, don't you? With like their, back, their backpacks almost on the ground. This is hazardous to a kid's health. And yet, we see it all the time. It's normal, right, for a kid to wear a backpack. But other people in other cultures look at that. They're abusing their children. <laughs> Why are they making their kids wear that? Well, we're not going to stop there. Um, I'm a runner. Look out. We're talking hazard. Um, there's, there's studies about running shoes that they're really bad for you, and especially all those bells and whistles and the bubbles and the, all kinds of fancy stuff, you have more accidents. There's, a, there's research that shows the one factor in terms of accident, injuries, the more you spend on your running shoes, the more likely you are to be injured. <laughs> and they're, and they're, the running shoe companies, and I'm sorry if you're in here in this industry, um, 
they, the, the, the uh, sports medicine people challenge them, show us some data that your shoes are good for us. Not a peep out of the running shoe industry, because they're not. And those are my shoes, so I'm not just picking on, I'm not just picking on other people. Oh, man. <laughs> what can I say? I think of these as torture instruments designed by men. And, I mean, there's lots of data about how bad they are for, you know, b back problems, hip problems, bunions, and try to escape a burning building in these. Not going to happen. And where did my other one go? Sorry, guys. Do you know the research on these things? If your doctor's wearing one, tell him to take it off. They carry germs. And actually, in some, um, in some uh, medical facilities in Europe, ties are banned among doctors because they're carrying germs around. And then there's some research that shows that it restricts blood flow and makes men have a harder time with certain tasks and mental abilities. So if you ever wonder what's going on in Washington, D.C., <laughs> there is the tie problem. Sorry, but this is also problematic. Um, there's research that shows that bras, I was talking to a woman who works, um, she's a um, OBGYN specialized nurse, and um, she said, yeah, they, they, they restrict your lymph glands, you're more likely to have all kinds of problems, especially underwires, and this is just normal attire that is actually quite dangerous. <laughs> and we wear it every day, we don't think about it, and yet we point the finger at people who are choosing for their own dignity and their well-being to wear a headscarf. Hmm. Hmm. Just want to give you something to think about in that area. And in closing, I had the, the privilege of being at the Islamic Society of North America Convention, which happened in Detroit over Labor Day weekend. 15,000 Muslims. I spent like three or four days with 15,000 Muslims. And the keynote speaker was none other than your own Jimmy Carter. He was amazing. And he spoke to the, the packed audience. And up front, there were the imams, the spiritual leaders. And he said, the most pressing civil rights issue in the world today is women and girls. They knew what he was going to say when they invited him. And he talked about the discri discrimination against women. I had tears in my eyes just hearing this amazing man. Whew. And at one point he said to the men, if you think, and I think he pointed his finger, which surprised me, if you think you are superior to women. Allah says you're wrong. And Jimmy Carter is not just a talker, he's a doer. So he pulled out the Declaration of Justice and Equality for Muslim Women. And all of the imams who were sitting in the front came up and signed it. They knew this was happening. They were on board. You can read the body of this. It's saying, holding up the beauty, the sacredness respect for women. They all signed it. I had tears in my eyes watching this. The next day, I looked at the Detroit paper to see, guess what? Not a peep. Not a peep. The ex-president, former president, was there talking about, with 15,000 women, about respect and justice for women. The media will not cover it. Did you hear about this? You did. One person has heard about this. So there are certainly problems and issues and injustice which tend to do with the local culture. Not just among Muslims, but among human beings. And there are many, many Muslims who are standing up against it and calling for, yes, a reformation in Islam. And Islam, in its origin, was a liberation and a respect for women, 
Muhammad, the prophet, peace be upon him, was a great reverencer of women. This tradition, his words, have been distorted, but in their essence, they're respectful. So let me leave you with an invitation to walk a mile in a man's moccasins before you judge him, and to sit a minute under a woman's headscarf before you judge her. May it be so. Blessed be.